My name is Simon Tran and I'm ProPublica's events associate. Welcome to Documenting Hate 2021 from the Capitol Riot to Anti-Asian Violence. Today's event is brought to you by the generous support by, of McKinsey and Company. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. From 2016 to 2019, ProPublica oversaw a data project called Documenting Hate, which led a coalition of 180 newsrooms across the country aiming to address one of the most urgent and least understood corners of American criminals, uh, of America's criminal justice system, hate crimes. We collected more than 6,000 reporting tips, thousands of pages on police reports on hate crimes and produced over 230 stories. However, from the January insurrection on the US Capitol to the increase um, of anti-Asian violence, this past year has shown us that the need to track and address hate is more crucial than ever. For our conversation today, we're joined by three panelists, Arthi Kohli, who is the Executive Director of Asian American Advancing Justice, Asian Law Caucus, the first organization in the country to represent and promote the legal and civil rights of Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Marshall Wong has coordinated anti-hate crime programs for the Los Angeles County Commission on Human Relations since 1999. He is the principal author of the agency's annual hate crime report and staffs a countywide coalition, the Network Against Hate Crime. And Damon Hewitt is a longtime civil rights lawyer, social justice strategist and coalition builder who serves as the acting president and executive directors, director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Thank you to our panel for joining today. Also, this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow to everyone who registered. Our moderator, moderator today is ProPublica reporter AC Thompson. His work focuses on the criminal justice system, hate crimes, and investigating extremist groups. He most recently worked on the frontline documentary, American Insurrection, which examined how far-right extremist groups have evolved in the wake of the 2017 Charlottesville rally. AC, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Simon. Um, I appreciate it. And everyone should know I paid Simon to give me such a nice plug. Um, and a nice intro. You know, um, so glad to have this group together and to have this conversation. It feels like a really crucial and important conversation to be having right now. Um, the thing that sticks out to me is the federal government through the FBI has been collecting hate crime statistics for about three decades. And yet every time somebody takes a look closely at those statistics, they say, information is, is erroneous, it's incomplete, it doesn't represent the full picture. I just want to throw it to all the panelists to, to uh, feel free to take a, a crack at this. What is going wrong here and what needs to change for us to get an accurate accounting of what's really happening? Any of you can take that. Marshall, I think you're talking, but you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the most important thing is to address the, fa the, the fact that uh, reporting to the FBI is voluntary. And 85% um, of the law enforcement agencies around the country either don't report anything at all or say they have had no hate crimes reported in their jurisdictions. So I think that that is probably the biggest hole that has to be filled. Uh, also, when it comes to the uh, actions of individual law enforcement agencies, uh, usually there is no training available for officers uh, past the, uh, some brief uh, introductory uh, training in the academy. And I think that that's a, a very serious problem as well. It's not considered a high priority by most law enforcement agencies. And, um, you know, there's always a, a, a struggle in terms of resources, because anytime you pull officers off of what they're doing uh, for training, you have to hire others to fill in their shoes. And then finally, I just wanted to say that one of the things that we've noted as far as gaps in the data is that institutions like prisons and jails 
juvenile detention facilities and schools uh, frequently have hate crimes or widespread racial brawls that don't get counted as hate crimes because the authorities in those cases prefer to handle those internally, administratively, and not call attention to racial tensions within their institutions. Um, yeah, I think I can add in a few more things, which is when we talk to elderly, particularly elderly um, Asian Americans, we found that um, they're not comfortable speaking to the police. There's language barriers, there's trust issues. Um, and the other piece of the equation is that a lot of what's happening are hate incidents. So verbal harassment, go back to your country, you know, um, they don't rise to the level of crime. It doesn't mean that people aren't harmed and traumatized, they are. Um, it feels like a verbal assault, but it, it's not a crime. And so um, there's no way to capture that. Um, and what we've seen is um, advocacy groups, you know, we had a hate tracker actually starting in 2016 around the election um, when there was a lot of anti-China rhetoric um, we started, you know, getting reports of, of um, uh, incidents and so have taken it in, you know, uh, have taken responsibility for trying to track this information because the government isn't getting access to it. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's a question we need to ask. Is it the right agencies that are collecting this data? Because if these are if these are not agencies that are trusted, then you know folks and they don't have cultural competency or language uh, you know access, then people are not going to be reporting to these agencies. AC, I would add that I echo uh, Marshall and, and Arte's comments. The trust issue is huge. We see that across communities, and I'm sure that is also, as they've said, really very much same, the same for AAPI communities as well. You're also you know, trying to do with the blunt instrument, uh, something that is a Herculean effort. As Artie said, not every incident is a crime. It feels criminal. You, you feel the violation, the personal humiliation, and sometimes the physical injury or just the threat, right? What that does to one's psyche, the, having to be under threat, especially for elders. Uh, if you're a younger person, you wanna protect them. If you're an elder, you wanna protect the, the younger uh, people as well. And so we need cross agency responses. We need cross community responses as well. We spend at the Lawyers Committee a lot of time training law enforcement on how to get ahead of these types of incidents. Because if we don't widen that circle of human concern beforehand, it's difficult to thread the needle afterwards and say, well, now I'm hurt, you must care. Now I'm hurt, you must do something. And we're dealing with the justice system that's never going to make anyone whole when you face that kind of atrocity and that injury. So we do need training for law enforcement. I do agree with Marshall. We need to have that training ahead of time about how to stave off these kinds of incidents and how to be more responsive when they do happen as well. Hey, that's all That's all super, super helpful. I just, a, a quick follow-up for you, Damon. You made a great point that the justice system is never gonna make people whole. And I think, I think that's uh, an unfortunate reality, but it's a reality. What do you suggest um, the role of the justice system should be or the role of government in the community should be to help people feel a sense of security and wholeness again? Well, look, I would say it, it can't just be a law enforcement response. There's certainly social services uh, as well uh, that can, should be made available for the impacted communities. I also think there needs to be some, some outreach to the communities of people who are causing the injury. Uh, outreach not in terms of just support, but outreach, outreach in terms of education uh, and accountability. Uh, it's, all of this really stems from an otherizing, right? Uh, that happens in, in, in homes and in their families and in the neighborhoods. That happens in schools. And I think any entity, especially uh, schools, systems of education, K through 12, those are prime places for socialization. It's so disappointing that so much of this is happening 
not just on the east and west coast, uh, but throughout the country, but in places where we have fairly diverse schools. Are we mm -hmm. really leveraging and taking advantage of the daily teachable moments of what it means to see your, humani your humanity uh, in reflected in someone else's eyes? Is it, are we able to do that? And frankly, I think the more we're teaching to tests, the more we're focusing on bottom lines, the less socialization, positive socialization we're doing, and also educating each other about each community's history, I think is, is also important, history and current uh, issues that communities are facing. That actually helps broaden that circle of human concern and helps with empathy and connectivity and limits and mitigates at least the danger of otherizing. That's great. Can I add just one quick thing? I mean, in addition to individual accountability, we have to look at our systems. In a couple of the major incidents that we've seen in New York and San Francisco, the perpetrators had significant mental health histories. And we have completely disinvested in mental health, um, in our mental health system. And partially because it was abusive. It was a, not a good system. So we let it go, but we didn't replace it with anything. And as a result, if you have mental health problems, either you're in prison or you're on the street. And so we have to take responsibility as a society too for the systems that we've created um, that are actually contributing to the harm. That is, a, that is a great observation. Somebody raised that with me yesterday. They said, you know, in some of these cases I'm seeing, it seems like the offenders who are being, or the, the people who are being arrested do not seem mentally well. They seem to be in psychiatric crisis themselves. And that's a great that's a great point that you're making that our systems have broken down to the point where we don't have useful uh, mental health treatment for many people. Jail ends up being their treatment, and that actually does not work because not you treatment. see <laughs> at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the the whole you know complex prison industrial is our national response to poverty. Our national response to uh, mental health issues and answer response to need. Um, and, and I should also mention that sometimes people who suffer mental health crises find themselves on a different uh, end of the, uh, of the stick, so to speak, with respect to law enforcement, uh, find themselves injured, killed. Uh, and we don't want to see that either for any community. That's right. That's right. Marshall, you've been doing this work in Los Angeles County for a long, long time, for 22 years. What, what are the sort of patterns that you're seeing these days as you help track hate crimes in the, the most populous county in America? Well, the trends that we see year after year are pretty consistent. Uh, about three quarters of hate crimes uh, target four groups, uh, the largest being African-Americans. Um, we've consistently seen African-Americans who only represent about 9% of LA County's population being about half of the victims of race, racial hate crimes. Terrible, terrible overrepresentation. Uh, one of the factors that has been driving the high number of anti-Black hate crimes uh, for decades has been um, street gangs. They are associated with the Mexican mafia, which is the largest and most violent of the prison-based gangs. And the Mexican mafia has been warring with Black inmates for decades. Uh, they've given the green light for their street affiliates to try to basically conduct campaigns of ethnic cleansing, trying to drive African-Americans out of their neighborhoods. Uh, the, fortunately, in uh, 2019, which is the most recent complete data set we have, is that we saw uh, Latino and Black crimes committed by gang members drop from 47% to only 33%. So we're really anxious to see whether or not that that um, dip continues because it's been a huge contributing factor. Um, the uh, uh, LA County may be uh, home to about 50% uh, of Latinos, but they only represent about a quarter of uh, racial hate crime victims. We think that's a terrible undercount. And that's partly due that to increasing concerns that contacting law enforcement could put victims or other members of their households in jeopardy of being detected by ICE. Um, but despite the relatively low numbers, which are not in, in, uh, insubstantial, um, Latino victims are, uh, are most likely of any racial group to uh, be experiencing violent hate crimes, 88%. 
And of those crimes, the most common are aggravated assaults. Also in 64% of the anti-Latino crimes, specific anti-immigrant slurs are employed, which I think is a reflection of some of the xenophobia, which has been gripping the US for some time. Um, crimes targeting gay men, lesbians, and especially transgender victims have a much higher likelihood of being of a violent nature than of other motivations. And finally, we see um, in, uh, consistently that in religious motivated crimes, they're anti-Semitic, but they tend to be nonviolent crimes against property as opposed to violent crimes against people. So those are some of the things that we've picked up um, year after year. Hey, thank you for that. And there's a couple points there that I want to circle back to in a little while, because I think some of this is counterintuitive for people at a certain level. Um, for, for you, RT, I, I wonder about this. After 9-11, we saw this huge surge in hate crimes and bias incidents that were directed largely at, at the South Asian community. It was directed at Muslim Americans. It was directed at people who were perceived to be Arabs or to be practicing Muslims. And I, I wonder if there's anything that we can learn from that time period and that surge in hatred and violence for this period that we're in now where we seem to be seeing this increase in attacks on the AAPI community. Absolutely, you know, I'm South Asian, so I remember that time so clearly and particularly Sikh Americans were targeted immediately um, and unfortunately continue to be targeted. But um, so last year when I started hearing about incidents uh, impacting the East Asian community, I was immediately brought back to post 9-11 and I contacted colleagues who were active at that time. And we agreed that what we needed to do is create an Asian American uh, table, leaders table, where we brought together more than hundred Asian American leaders from across the country to start scenario planning and thinking about what, how would we respond? What kind of rapid response can we have when there are hate incidents? And I hate to tell you this, but literally a year, more than a year ago, we did a scenario plan of, um, you know, a mass shooting well before Atlanta happened, well before Indianapolis. We knew it was coming. I mean, in, we were informed by the history of this country um, and the long history of anti-Asian racism, whether it's the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese American internment, killing of Vincent Chin, um, and then post 9-11. And it frustrates me to no end that even though we knew it was coming, we couldn't prevent it. Um, but you know, some of the key things that we learned from that time is first of all, we needed to be coordinated and aligned as community advocates and victims needed, need a lot of support. They're immediately inundated by press, by law enforcement, um, victims, families have, you know, lots of questions. They don't even understand the criminal legal system. All of a sudden they're pulled into it and they don't even know what's a pretrial hearing. What's this, what's that? So we are, we have to be there to support victims, families. We also have to be very, you know, mindful of, of people being able to tell their own stories, our communities being able to speak for ourselves rather than, you know, cops saying, oh, the perpetrator had a bad day, you know, and other people saying, actually, <laughs> there is race and gender at play here. And, um, you know, the fact that you can't see that is very problematic. And so, um, you know, all of that was in place, actually, we put that in place before Atlanta, and which is why we were able to support and work with the local groups on the ground um, to make sure that people, you know, had communications training so that when, you know, the press is talking to them, they are able to um, engage, you know, to protect the families, to set up the victims funds. So we learned a lot, unfortunately, from, from post 9-11. The other lesson is that interpersonal violence is not the only kind of aggression that happens. When you have this kind of scapegoating, you also see state policies, 
right? For so Muslim communities were continue to be surveilled, continue to be targeted and discriminated against. And that is happening to Asian American communities and particularly Chinese Americans. The Department of Justice has a China initiative. They are targeting Chinese scientists for paperwork violations, for you know, collaboration with scientists in China, for um, visa fraud, which you know, is really not fraud at all because you know, they didn't dis disclose each and every interaction with the Chinese government. And so we see that, you know, this, a similar pattern um, that um, Muslim, Arab, and Middle Eastern communities, South Asian communities were facing post 9-11 impacting East Asian communities. So you feel like that's a real parallel between that time period and this time period now? Absolutely. Um, and one of the other lessons learned from that time period is that I think for, for you know, Muslim and South Asian communities is that we couldn't fight back alone. We needed to do this work in solidarity with other communities of color. And that's the same um, lesson that we are trying to employ today, which is we have to work with um, Black and Latinx communities some of this violence is interracial violence. We've got to talk about that. Um, we've got to address it together because we're all in this container of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and part of the, one of the tactics is to divide us. And so we have to work really hard to fight back against that. Right, right. Thank you. Hey. Damon, I want to ask you about the, the scene in, in Congress. I know a couple years ago, uh, there was the no hate bill that was introduced that was supposed to sort of update our approach to hate crimes. I know that the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill has been introduced, uh, and that was defeated as well. I know now both of those bills are back. What is happening in Congress, and what do you think the prospects are for uh, this legislation? Well, I, great question. You know, just uh, yesterday, I was glad to uh, learn from our team that the No Hate Act, which was incorporated into another piece of legislation, has now passed. We expect it to be signed into law tomorrow uh, by President Biden. Now, here's the thing. Everything will not change overnight, right? This is federal legislation. It creates, uh, puts in place some of the things we've been talking about today, including what was law enforcement. But the uptake has to be there. The the tenacity, uh, the push from our communities has to uh, has to continue. And I think we we expect you know to to see what well, we are hopeful to see something of the same with the Emmett Till Anti Lynching Act. It is just atrocious that in this country, which has a horrible documented history of anti black racism and lynching of black people in particular, that we've never had federal legislation that addresses that, that just calls it exactly what it is and that bans and outlaws it. Sure, murder is is, is illegal in, in every state and under federal statutes. Uh, sure, uh, racist uh, hate violence is illegal under the uh, Matthew Shepard and James Byrd uh, legislation and other legislation as well, but we need this anti-lynching legislation. In some ways it is symbolic AC, in some ways it's kind of a barometer of where we are as a country and as a people, what our values are. I think our laws are a reflection of what our shared values and understandings are, but in many ways it's also functional. And I, I look forward to the provisions of uh, the No Hate Act actually being implemented. Uh, but again, we have to stay vigilant to make sure that there is uptake at the local and state level. That's, here's here's a, a thing too. Um, as I understand it, and tell me if I'm, I'm right about this, with the No Hate Act, a part of that is, is um, re reporting, that it's supposed to really strengthen and improve the reporting process. Does that sound right to you? Right, reporting and, and also training uh, is, are important facets as well. And I think on the, on the reporting side, it's, it's really about not just does something happen, is it recorded? You know, right now we have incidents uh, that are recorded as if uh, they happened in some parallel universe, you know, well, there was a murder, but yeah, but it was actually an active of racist hate as well. 
do we have recording systems, reporting systems that can cognize both? It's, it's a very basic thing, but you'd be surprised. And, and part of this is because, again, we haven't broadened our aperture, so to speak, as a, as a national community uh, with respect to shared interests and understandings uh, that a, a crime or an incident can be more than one thing. It can be intersectional. Uh, that it could be because this was an Asian American elder. Like it's important to be able to track that and not just say, oh, it's anti-Asian violence, period. That's important, but I think you have to be able to, to track that as well. Uh, similarly, what's, what happens to black boys who are profiled and regarded with suspicion and viewed as older than they really are for no reason except for their race? We have to be able to track that. What happens with black girls and being pushed out of school? We have to be able to track these things in an intersectional way. So. The data reporting system that's called for in that legislation, uh, it, there's an incentive, I should say, to encourage uh, and assist law enforcement agencies to use that kind of data reporting so we can have better information. Then, of course, the test is, what do we do with that information? What does a local law enforcement agency do with it? And also, what can communities do with it as well? One thing I will say about the reporting, no matter how good your reporting system it will always lag in terms of lived experience. There's gonna be a time lag from the time that you get good data uh, between, between the time something happens and when you get the data. And so we also have to make room for that anecdotal, uh, for that kind of qualitative information and data collection that really is reflective of what's happening. All the things that have been happening for the last several months in particular, uh, there is some data available, but in terms of uniform data, you'll be waiting for some time for that. So data is a, an important starting point, but it is not a destination. We, it's a basic thing that we've demanded, that communities have demanded, and I'm glad that we're making some inroads towards it. Right, right. It can be a trigger for action, but it's not. It, it, you still need that action, that response. Right. You know, I've been tracking the white supremacist groups, the anti-government groups, the militia groups for a bunch of years now. And as I was following the protests, through 2020 and through the election and after the election, it was really interesting to me that there were kind of a, a couple different things that I was seeing. And one was, it felt like the white supremacists had been kind of uh, in the shadows again for a couple of years. They'd been off, not so open, not out at the protest so much. And then I'm seeing all these guys who are overt and avow avowed white nationalists at the stop the steal protest at the um, you know overturn the election protest I'm seeing um, guys who are Nazi skinheads who are kind of slightly rebranding themselves and um, you know just slightly distancing themselves from their their Nazi past Marshall uh, in LA like how how much of an impact do these sort of organized hate groups the ultra nationalist groups the extreme right groups how much how much of a of an effect do do they have in, in your jurisdiction well in uh, 2019 crimes where there was evidence of white supremacist ideology grew 38% but these were most commonly cases of swastikas or other hate symbols in graffiti um, now that included nearly half of the religious motivated crimes, but none of those included specific names of white supremacist groups. In the past, we've had reported crimes tied to organizations like Hammersmith Nation, Nazi Lowriders, the Pecker Woods. Most of the white supremacist groups that claim to have a presence in Southern California might have an outdated website or a PO box, but not actual uh, active chapters. As a matter of fact, in recent years, when some of those organizations um, have uh, tried to have public rallies, they've had to import supporters from all over the state and sometimes crossing state lines to get 25 people standing together. And they're always, you know, outnumbered 10, 10 20 times, maybe 100 times by counter protesters. Um, we think that most of the white supremacists who are operating in Southern California, they're not formal members of organizations, but they connect with each other through the internet. Now, there are a couple of newer groups uh, that are visible, like the Proud Boys and the Rise Above Movement, and some have been arrested and convicted of crimes, but those crimes occurred in other jurisdictions. 
where they actually traveled to try to attack Antifa counter protesters in Northern California. You know, some, you know, were convicted for being at Charlottesville. And so we do know that they are active um, in Southern California, but that's not where their crimes have occurred. Yeah, can I just add that um, last spring, our office was tagged as were, I think other businesses in Chinatown in San Francisco by the Patriot Front. And they went and put their stickers all over, they put it on our sign. Um, um, and they are an offshoot, I think of the group in, from Charlottesville. Um, and, and that happened, I believe in Seattle as well. Uh, and I wanna second Marshall's point about um, social media. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is these white supremacist groups are actually trying to put, trying to court Asian Americans and divide Asian Americans from black communities in particular. And, um, you know, putting in messages saying, you know, why did you support criminal justice reforms? You know, it's black people. It's the reason you're being harmed are, are black people. I mean, you know, really um, offensive messaging to our communities. Um, you know, as if they care about our communities, <laughs> but um, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. That's, that, so interesting. So are you, you are seeing this on social media that the white supremacist groups are trying to recruit uh, members of the Asian American community and sort of turn them against other communities of color. Is this- Yeah, yeah I, it's recruitment in the sense of like, being a part of the group, but trying to cause racial, you know, separation and, and dissension and blaming, um, you know, and, and so um, it's, it's really problematic because they, they're actually quite sharp and they're not just doing it in English forums. They're going to, you know, WeChat and these other forums that are in language. There's like Korean language, there's, uh, you know, uh, chi uh, Chinese language uh, media, as well as other, you know, um, Asian language media. And so we see these messages courting our communities, you know, trying to uh, have people oppose social progress. Right. If, if, AC, if I could, you know, it's, this is part of a longstanding, um, you know, I would say, I dare say tradition of ensuring that crime is, uh, that, that race is criminalized and that crime is racialized, right? Uh, and it's also reflected, frankly, in terms of the narratives, the negative narratives about access to institutions. So for example, on higher education, at the lawyers community right now, we're uh, fighting alongside a AAPI so yeah. and, and, and other orgs uh, at UT Austin, in Texas, at Harvard. Uh, there's a, an approach to try to get up to the Supreme Court right now with the new super conservative majority, super majority conservatives. Uh, and also UNC, uh, Charlotte and Yale as well. There's litigation on multiple fronts and in pretty much every front, the new tech is, well, this hurts Asians. So Asians, you should be outraged. Like, well, look what these black people are doing to you. And so, and, and you see the end game. It's all designed so that when Asian American AAPI communities are attacked, who's gonna come to support you? Who's gonna come to your defense? And that's why that kind of authentic solidarity that Archie talked about a few minutes ago is so very important. We have to resist these efforts uh, to divide while also addressing real issues uh, between and across communities. One of the really frightening uh, websites that I saw early on during the pandemic, right after there were the first reports of um, anti-Asian violence was one which, um, which was labeled the second amendment as the best friend that Asian Americans ever had. And the photographs were during of um, Korean merchants on the rooftops of their stores during the LA riots with um, rifles. And um, th this was one of those things that I just feared was going to feed stereotypes about black criminality and uh, pose it in such a way that was going to alarm people uh, and get them to uh, see uh, vigilantism was the answer. And unfortunately, we have seen gun sales going up uh, in Asian American neighborhoods. Um, I, I actually don't know whether or not the uh, originators of that website were, uh, were from outside of the community or just ultra conservative forces from within. 
That, that's super interesting. And that's, you know, Marshall, that was one of the things I was going to circle back to, and everybody's kind of touched it now with these sort of conversations that we need to have between different communities of color and not purely between the white uh, majority and communities of color, that often there's these fault lines between our different communities that sort of get left out of the, the conversation. And you've all kind of touched on that in different ways. I thought that was an important thing that I wanted to to make sure we dealt with. Simon is telling me that we have to wrap up uh, my portion of the program and invite in the audience and let them have their say now. So if that's cool with everyone, he's gonna start throwing questions from the audience to us. Thanks, AC. Really appreciate this discussion. Um, we have a lot of questions and we're trying to get to all of them. Um, my first question, um, from, uh, to the panelists is that, what are the viable pathways and next steps for accountability? You know, we talked a little bit about the systemic kind of level, talking about, you know, um, the anti, um, you know, hate laws that are being, you know, hopefully, you know, passed, but um, what about on the individual level? I think context matters. Um, and so I go back to what Damon was saying about, you know, schools and actually right, be right before the pandemic started, some of the hate incidents were at schools. Um, and we, I'm now that schools are going to be back in, per many schools are going back in person. We, I imagine that's going to continue. In that kind of context, I think um, some sort of restorative circles that a lot of, you know, that some schools are experimenting with. Um, is one way to address um, accountability, you know, having a peer process of restorative justice process that goes to the heart of, you know, why this incident happened, what are the beliefs. I think what's hard is we don't want to contribute to a school to prison pipeline, right? And what we've learned and what we've just talked about is, you know, when you're in prison, you're get, you get separated by race. And it reinforces any racial bias that you might come in with. It's not getting to the root of it. And so I think that's the challenge. We see a lot of gaps with our current system around rehabilitation and addressing, um, you know, how do we walk people back from, from their racial biases? Um, and so that's, you know, that's something that I think many Asian American advocates are struggling with you know, we're working on ending mass incarceration. Do we want to reinforce this existing system? All right. Now, I, I would also underscore what Arthur said about education and, and to add to what I mentioned earlier, uh, students are going back to college campuses as well. And it's, it's critical that in these, there's so many contested spaces, you know, my alma mater, uh, LSU, Louisiana State University, uh, gave us alumni like Donna Brazil, but also David Duke. Right, and so you know when you have when you have those kind of of, of uh, I won't even call them polar opposites, but different types of of voices, um, you know, you know, on, on a college campus, you have to be able to navigate that space. So at the lawyers community, we're actually developing tools. We've done, developed some in the past, but developing more tools for college campuses to use. I also think it's important for higher ed leadership to step in. I want to give a big shout out to uh, Kevin Warren, the commissioner of the Big Ten athletic conference for the work that they've done with their anti-racism coalition uh, throughout that conference to really help students navigate these contested spaces and also move from thought leadership and connection to action on those individual college campuses. We need to see more of that, especially as campuses are repopulated this fall. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my next question is, you know, um, folks are kind of curious who, you know, may deal with or be threatened by hate crimes themselves. And so folks were wondering, um, you know, what do people do if they see hate or if they witness or they experience hate? Um, you know, um, I'm just curious if there are any alternatives or any ways in which people and tools in which people can use um, during these, in these situations. Yeah, my organization, Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus, um, is regularly, as well as our partners at other advancing justice organizations across the country, are holding bystander intervention trainings. 
Um, and I think it's a great way. They're open to the community. There's no cost. Um, you know, if folks want to get trained on how to safely and comfortably intervene, um, you know, if you're witnessing a hate incident, um, and it, you know, obviously context matters, but there are, you know, different um, uh, options, whether you, you know, go for help or whether you intervene at the moment and that you people can learn about. I will tell you that given that, um, you know, over 65% of what's reported is verbal assault, um, people feel very traumatized. It happens in public, like at a cafe, a park. Somebody tells them, you know, calls them like the C word, go back to your country. And, and what's doubly traumatizing is that they are surrounded by people and no one does anything. No one intervenes, no one stands up for them, no one documents it. I mean, it's, it's really bad. And so, um, and I can understand it as a bystander, you might be frozen. You might, you know, you might not know how to react. So I think uh, if folks do wanna um, get trained, it's a great way to um, learn how to, how to intervene. This wonderful training, we shared it with our staff uh, a couple of months ago, um, uh, along with, you know, just other examples of what individuals have done. But it's also important to learn from when there is inaction. Uh, when people stand by and, and, and allow things to happen. I don't even express concern or comfort thereafter. But on the resource front, I did want to mention that at the Lawyers Committee, we've organized our work on stopping hate into what we call the James Byrd Jr. Center uh, to Stop Hate. And we actually have a hotline that uh, the details of which we make available to community partners and a couple of different coalitions. The hotline is 1-844-9-NO-HATE, 1-844-9-NO-HATE. Um, and it, the number is 1-844-966-4283. We encourage people to call. It's important to document. That's Human Rights 101, to document what's happening so people's stories can be heard. And also we can direct them to resources and assistance as well. I just wanted to mention that in the midst of all this tragedy and um, uh, anxiety, there have been some very, very uh, moving examples of how people have stepped in and intervened. In Orange County recently, there was an elderly Korean couple, 79 and 80 years old, who were punched and knocked to the ground. And uh, the other people who were exercising in the park uh, immediately surrounded him and held him until law enforcement arrived. Um, it turned out that two weeks previously, he had harassed another Asian woman um, and uh, you know had made it a habit of, of doing that in that park. There was a Chinese immigrant family also in Orange County uh, who were the recipients of all kinds of harassment, um, including, you know, youth, neighborhood youth ringing their doorbells in the middle of the night to like wake, wake them up. And the neighbors got together and they put up, put lawn chairs in front of their house and they took shifts, uh, you know, and staying, uh, doing patrols throughout the night to make sure that the family felt safe. Um, so uh, until until it ended, and uh, so I think people have really stepped up when when they've uh, been able to in some cases. Thank you. My next question is, you know, we, we're focusing more on California today, but obviously hate crimes and hate groups is present across the country, and so what. What, are, what is happening across the country? Um, Damon, you know, you are in DC, right? So you're thinking more nationally as well, but we're just kind of curious about um, what is being done that can hold states with high presences of hate crimes and hate groups accountable across the country. Well, I, I think the accountability, accountability cannot be only at the state level of state government. Uh, a lot of, you know, this is interpersonal as well. I do think that uh, the state so to speak, uh, in a broader sense, local, uh, county, federal, state, has a, a special obligation to make sure that all of us are protected or protected and served as, as, they, as they say in law enforcement. So I think that's, that's part of the obligation, but also that affirmative obligation uh, to be able to s understand these, these tensions. I mean, we're coming out of uh, the decennial census count. There'll be some questions about the numbers, but we'll get a rough sense of whether there's been significant growth and populations and whether there's been growth in populations 
uh, and as well there's battles about redistricting and drawing district lines, there's also going to be some of these tensions. This it's not rocket science. We have all the information we need if we listen to young people, if we listen to parents, if we listen to educators, we can see uh, what these fault lines are. So if the question is about how to hold state governments accountable, I think that's a really small part of the picture. Uh, but gubernatorial leadership will be great. Uh, the leadership of, of uh, state legislators, whether they be a supermajority Republican, as so many states are, or whether they be by uh, split uh, leadership in a bicameral legislature, Democrat, Republican, or other parties. I think it's, it's important that everyone see this as their issue. This is not an Asian issue. This is not a Black issue. This is our issue as, as a nation. So I uh, certainly would, would love to see more leadership forthcoming at the state level. Yeah, I will just um, add that, you know, at this Asian American Leaders Table, we've got folks from Texas, Ohio, Wisconsin, you know, hate is happening definitely all over the country. And it's actually much harder in communities where there aren't advocacy groups, there aren't, you know, resources for community. And representation really matters in that moment. And Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial minority in this country. By 2050, we're gonna be 10% of the population. And I think people aren't realizing that. Um, and you see this growth in the South, you see it in the Midwest, you see it in key regions. And part of what we've been doing is actually um, supporting local partners um, on both voter protection, voting access, um, and redistricting because we need people who come from our communities in local and state government. Um, because if we don't have that, we won't be seen as a community. Thank you for that. We've we'll been getting a lot of questions about, um, and we talked a little bit about this, but about the insurrection in January. And so BC, I definitely wanted to come to you. I know we had some questions, um, curious about what you have to say in your reporting, but can you talk a little bit more about the work that you were doing um, during um, for your documentary, but then also the trends and things that you realized since, you know, um, a few years back when the Charlottesville rally happened. Yeah, you, so I touched on this a little bit earlier when I was blabbing on and on, but, you know, it was interesting to me to see if you look back to my mind, Charlottesville is the apex of the modern overt white supremacist movement. That's 2017. And then after that, a lot of people in that movement kind of go back into the holes from whence they came. They leave the movement. They perhaps adapt terrorist tactics. And then we see this wave of terror action after that with synagogue shootings, with um, the shootings in El Paso, with the Christchurch shooting. But there was another group of people that said, hey, what we should do is rebrand and we should get rid of the overt Nazi imagery. We should get rid of the obviously racist sloganeering. We should do something that's a little bit tamed down. So for example, the group that Arti was talking about, Patriot Front, they had been a group that was in Charlottesville. It was their member, um, they were called at that time uh, Vanguard America. It was their member, James Fields, who killed Heather Heyer, who drove his car into the crowd. After Charlottesville, the group is part of this bigger discussion that says, hey, it's all about optics. It's all about how people look at us. It's branding. So we're going to use um, American icons. We're going to use the flag. We're going to use the American eagle. We're going to use an appeal to patriotism. And we're going to push for basically the same agenda, but it's going to be slightly less uh, obviously racist. And I think that was what we've seen in the last couple of years. And that was a lot of the people who were at the Capitol on January 6th. Well, I would just add that um, the alignment of some of those elements, AC, uh, with uh, a prior presidential uh, campaign and administration, I think was telling of the kind of real politic they were involved in, right? Like, well, we may not get everything we want, but we'll get a uh, essentially a, full, a champion of sorts in the White House was the effort. and. Just in terms of the rebranding, some of this is, is a recent vintage. Some of it may not be really new at all. I mean, we've been making America great again for a long time. You know, David Duke in the 70s, Ronald Reagan in the 80s, and 
and, and, and former President Trump, and probably even if you go way before that. So I, I think what you're saying, I, I agree with you, like there's been the efforts to rebrand and recycle, right? The rhetoric are very intentional uh, and are designed to play to the psyches, to divide communities uh, along those fault lines that Arthur was talking about. Uh, and the same ones we hear today, what we heard 50 years ago or 30 years ago, and we'll probably be hearing them again, uh, right? Because th this stuff isn't going away. Uh, I'd like to think that as America grows and changes and demographics shift, uh, that does some work for us, but it won't do all of the work. We have to you know, stay vigilant and stay alert. I think the fact that polls show that 40% of white Americans are very anxious about the demographic changes, um, really underscores why immigration has been seized upon by a lot of white nationalists uh, as a hot button issue and possibly the most polarizing one in America today. Um, and I, I think that uh, the um, mainstreaming of white nationalism in, address, in, in publicly uh, getting involved in public policy matters around that you know, is a strategic one. On, on their part um, and uh, tapping into that fear that whites are being replaced and that um, there's only one, going to be one way to stop that, which is to close down the borders and to re reject uh, dreamers and to break up families and to stop chain migration and on and on and on. And that's part of the mainstreaming of their message um, which actually uh, attracts a, a broader uh, swath of support than the Minutemen, you know, carrying arms on the border. Thank you. We have a few more minutes left, and so uh, let's answer two more questions. Um, the second last question is, what is the toughest reporting decision you've had to make in terms of classifying something as a hate crime? Um, what data evidence do you use to inform this decision? And anyone can answer that one. Well, I think the decision isn't ours. Well, Marshall, maybe you should, I'll let you go ahead. Well, following 9-11, uh, there were a few cases which just caused tremendous anxiety and panic uh, among Muslims uh, people of Middle Eastern and South Asian background. I remember in one, uh, the, there was a Palestinian door-to-door -door salesman who was found shot to death um, uh, near his vehicle. His wallet was taken and it was widely assumed since this occurred right after 9-11 that this was a hate crime. Um, as it turned out, uh, as the investigation proceeded, it, it did turn out to be uh, gang members who had witnessed him doing his um, rounds and knew when to, when to expect him. And they tried to carjack him. And when he didn't give up his keys, one of them panicked, shot him, which was not the plan. And then they all ran in different directions and fled the scene without taking anything. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think that th there are a number of crimes, particularly you know, during that that difficult period, which were uh, which caused tremendous, tremendous fear, um, uh, and uh, they they turned out not to be. And there are some other cases that were similar to that, which have never been solved. You know, and we don't know, you know, what the um, the actual motivation was for some of for some of the homicides. Yeah, I would just like to underscore that point, which is we don't always know the motivation, but we know the impact. The impact on our communities, like after Atlanta, we work with a lot of low wage workers who work in nail salons and in other care industries. They were afraid to walk out their door. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the piece that I think we also need to focus on is you know, um, how do we provide um, a level of safety for our communities when they, these are, you know, these, these harms are so public? Thank you. My final question um, is, 
what are the most effective strategies you've seen used to counter hate, whether organized groups or youth, um, yeah, organized groups. So. I think there are um, a number of different strategies. Definitely one, a community coming together to say that we're not gonna tolerate this is important. So, you know, um, public affirmations of care, individual affirmations of care, you know, people reaching out to each other, that's, you know, important. Because we have to set our values as a community and as a society. And if people are breaking those values, they have to um, have consequences for that. And, and so, you know, that's one of the key things. I think if you're trying to get at, you know, deep rooted hate, it's a long journey of, of um, you know, working with people and their trauma. I mean, I think there are some groups that work with, you know, former uh, white supremacists or neo-Nazis where they talk about how these people, you know, a child is not born hating, hate is taught. And, you know, they, they grew up in environments that were taught hate, plus you have all this messaging, you know, whether it's anti-Blackness, anti-Asian messaging, it's around. And so that gets absorbed by people. And so, you know, having a long process of, of a person delving deep into their background and um, acknowledging the harm. And restorative justice practices do this, but it requires a deep commitment. Um, and I don't know that we've committed to that kind of, those kinds of systems. Like we should, re, we, re, we need to, you know, if we're looking at where hate happens, look at our prison system. And so, you know, I think those are some of the things that we need to address. I think the number one issue is multicultural education and not just um, the introduction of heroes and contributions by different, you know, racial and ethnic groups and religious groups to this country, but also delving into in an age appropriate way throughout K through 12 about de dealing with difficult chapters of American history uh, and the history of systemic racism and inner ethnic group conflict. I think that uh, it's shocking that, that now re requiring in California in certain state systems that a single ethnic studies requirement, it, it, classes required, you know, for uh, graduation. I mean, I think that that's uh, far too little. And um, I think that uh, as a part-time uh, professor of ethnic studies, I'm always amazed at how ill-prepared um, students are freshmen, sophomores, for, for being culturally literate, to be able to talk with people who are different from themselves, for being able to empathize because they had no preparation in their K through 12 education. And I think that that's uh, pivotal and that's not a short answer, but I think that long range that's, um, you know, foundational. I would agree with Arthur and Marshall, I would just say, really, this is about truth telling. Uh, that, as long as the information is accurate, that's great. There's so much misinformation, intentional disinformation out there today. Just simply laying the truth before folks doesn't do all the work, but it has to be a foundation. Otherwise, we have you know people young and, and elder uh, arguing over uh, things that they each think are facts, which are, may not actually be true at all. So I think starting with the foundation of truth and understanding uh, our history, uh, is important to figure out how we can move forward. Well, that's our time for today. Thank you so much to our panelists, Arthi Coley, <laughs> Damon Hewitt, and Marshall Wong for this excellent conversation and our moderator, AC Thompson, uh, for this excellent um, discussion um, about hate crimes and hate groups. I'd like to thank our special, um, a special thank you to McKinsey and Company for their support. And thank you to our audience for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. Um, again, this event will be recorded, so you'll receive us tomorrow with the full video um, of today's event. And so be on the lookout for that. We'll also post it on our YouTube channel. And from all of us at ProPolica, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and see you next time.